Egypt. Right, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for improving the uh, 60 gig wireless kit and improving the range. Um, we had a customer contact us only about a week or two ago and he was saying, I've put a pair of wireless wire dishes up um, and I'm now worried about them working or not at 900 meters. These are the dishes that can already be quoted at 1.5 kilometers and he's worried about 900 meters. And now we're looking at about 4K, so that's cool. He doesn't need to worry, which is what I told him. So, who am I? Started off being trained in the 1970s, dealing with very, very high powered radios um, for the Merchant Navy at a training college uh, down in Kent um, called uh, uh, Greenhithe, at a village called Greenhithe. It's now gone, but it was a big training college down there. And I learned everything about electronics and RF and did my HND down there and was ready to go to sea. So this was the late 1970s. There was a massive worldwide oil crisis going on at the time and I couldn't get a ship for love nor money. Nobody wanted me and they basically said, well, there's a queue of about 100 officers. Once we've worked through the other 99 that are in front of you, then you can have a ship and you can get on board and you can start your career in the Navy. That never happened. I actually ended up working for the UK government for the majority of my lifetime where I played with a large amount of devices uh, on RF and very, very small devices on RF, um, building them because we, we worked in a department where we couldn't buy off-the-shelf commercially available equipment. Everything had to be constructed in-house, so it was designed, built, printed circuit boards, building the equipment, making them as small as possible so that we could hide them, and then hopefully at some time in the later date, retrieve them again where we could find where we'd hidden them. Um, the other reason for building it all in-house was it meant that nobody knew what we were doing. Because if you go to a manufacturer and say, we'd like to have 100 of device X, they now knew, ah, so you're, oh, that's interesting. Wonder why they want one of those. So no, we don't tell anybody anything. We built them all in-house. It was a cool job and uh, ended up doing about 30 years working with RF from DC to light, which is why I tend to specialize in wireless. But then they made me redundant because um, central government needed to downsize. Uh, and it meant that uh, I ended up, um, if I can start back again, I ended up going into private industry as a consultant, uh, IT support, networking support, and needed to do a wireless hotspot somewhere with a captive portal. Did some Googling, found Microtik, and it was a journey that's now lasted since, I know, the 2000 odd. So I've been doing it for nearly, nearly 20 years now, been doing um, uh, networking side of the business. In the last few years of my life in government, I worked in Ofcom, or as it was before then, the Radio Communications Agency, troubleshooting other people's interference problems, uh, licensing, doing enforcement work, shutting pirate radio stations down, uh, liaising with the local police, raiding flats, raiding all kinds of things. Great, exciting job. Um, but then they say I got made redundant and um, don't do that anymore. But basically, my entire life has been dealing with RF and now mostly with Microtik. Became a consultant in 2008, became a trainer in 2009, and then joined Lin ITX. And uh, we are now uh, the UK's largest um, Microtik master distributor and a value added distributor. We've got about seven employees with various numbers of Microtik certifications, which I have trained in-house. Why not? It's free. Uh, so we've got quite a few consultants that are in the company as well. Microtik lists the distributors on their website in order of sale volume. So we're at number one. But we're not just a master distributor. 
We're actually also a training center. We have a dedicated training room. And there may be some of you in there. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm in there. I know all of you. All of you. Uh, we've got two certified trainers in-house. Uh, we, we do train in other manufacturers' equipment as well, but mostly Microtech. We're not just a box shifter. We do training as well as distributing a product. We're also a founding member of the week-long Microtech training boot camp at Microtech's own in-house RouterOS training center. A dedicated building, um, renovated and constructed to be designed as a training center for Microtech themselves, for their own staff, for in-house training, but they hire it out to muggins like me who keep going over to Riga. I love the place, it's a fantastic city, it's really cheap to get there. If you go with the likes of Brian Air or Sleazy Jet, it's very, very low cost to get there. The hotel is a four-star hotel just around the corner from the training center. You can see there, for the amount of costs that you're looking at for a week's training, of course, you're going to be doing 100% training. There's no fun involved, okay? Hard work, you're going to say to your managers and your bosses. You're going to knuckle down and do your training courses in Riga. But you actually works out roughly the same cost as going to the other end of the country and staying in a hotel at the other end of the UK um, and all the railway, anyone who's bought a railway ticket in the last uh, couple of years knows exactly how expensive it is to go somewhere by rail. So for the same sort of price, you can actually enjoy, I'm sorry, not enjoy, I mean work really hard at the Microtech Training Centre in, in Riga, Latvia. We do two a year, one in the summer, one in the winter. Um, yes, it does get cold in the winter, wrap up warm, but it's still fun, lots of snow. This is the last photograph that we did uh, of our summer one that we did in, in earlier this year. Um, we had a lot of fun. I mean, I mean, we all work very, very hard. But we're not just a box shifter. We don't just do training. We're hoping to hear the news that uh, we will have the first UK academy for Microtech. Um, you may hear some more about um, uh, what the academy is all about from Microtech themselves later on today. But the idea is this is a technical university uh, over at uh, Norwich and we're very, very proud to be involved in helping them to train their students in Microtech Router OS up to MTCNA level. So this is teenagers now being able to go out into the world and actually have some real good core networking skills and understand about routing, firewalling, security, um, and that that's going to give them a good step. It's going to give them a good good step up in their in their future careers. So we get a lot of phone calls from our customers saying this doesn't work. Why? I think it's a bug. I think I found a feature. It's undocumented. It doesn't work. What is wrong with it? Do I need to email Microtech? And we have a look at it, and it's just because of mistakes and assumptions that they have made as to the reasons for why it doesn't work. So it's not actually Microtech's fault. It's a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of understanding on how they've configured it that's caused the problem. So bear with me. We're going to have a bit of fun. But we're going to explain some of the common mistakes that we are getting all the time on the phones. So, I'm missing a guy. Where's he gone? There we go. Dave. For those who went to the Berlin Mum, remember Mike and Dave? He ended up with a HAP AC squared, and he got it all configured. He'd watched some guy at the Microtech Mum from, from Microtech and pointed out the problems with his slow path and fast path configuration errors, and he's now got a really fast router. He's happy with what he's got. However, he then spotted that it's got wireless built into it. And he could do with replacing and renewing the wireless in his office. So let's use it for wireless. He's just recently done his MTCNA. So he knows how to configure wireless. He's now got his knowledge. He knows how to do that. He's even ended up with a free T-shirt from us as well. The other cool thing he noticed was his dual band. So he's got 2.4 
and also five gigs on board. Just in one small plastic box, he's actually able to do both bands, which he wasn't able to have before because he was just running 2.4 in the office previously. It was just a really, really old 802.11 BG. Maybe he had some net gears or something, or D-Links or something. And it's about time they got put in the skip and upgraded with this new AC thing, or as it's now called, Wi-Fi 5. But the thing is, he doesn't really know how far this HAP AC squared is going to go, how many of these things he's going to need in his office. So he does some Googling. He can't find anything on Microtik's website that says what the range of an access point actually is. Because that's funny, because when he goes onto other manufacturers' websites, he finds it straight away. So he's found a manufacturer that says you can get 600 feet out of an access point, 183 meters range from one single tiny little plastic box. Fantastic! Which case, I only need the one. Which is brilliant. I love this Microtech stuff. Wait till he sees the four kilometer range on the 60 gig stuff. So, it's in the data cabinet. Well, that's cool, that's fine. Because you notice it's in the data cabinet and it's right in the middle of his office. So his circle, his radius of coverage, is perfect. So he doesn't even need to move it. It's fine where it is, in the rack, in the data cabinet. The steel data cabinet. In the canteen. Can you see what's coming next? Just above the microwave. <laughs> oh, you've done it yourself. You've seen it, haven't you? Okay, and we've seen it, and we've heard about it a lot. Every time they're having their lunch break, or dinner break, coffee break, the wireless stops working. Why? Well, I wonder why. Okay, but he's so excited, so excited about how quick it was to get him to enable it, because he just logged in, enabled the 2.4, enabled the 5, put an SSID on, put a security profile in with a password on it, he's up and running. Two minutes. Amazing. Two minutes, he's now got working Wi-Fi in the office. He tweeted. He was so excited, he tweeted. Can't hold this man back. Then he walks around the office using his phone. Doesn't matter whether it's an iBling or an Android, but he walks around the office with his phone. He thinks, oh, that's a bit funny. Not quite getting the sort of signal strengths I was hoping for. And it doesn't change very much as I walk around. And at the extremities of the office, it's really, really weak. And sometimes even drops out completely. Well, that's no good. Because the competitor said you could do 183 meters, 600 foot. These things are rubbish. What's the matter with these rubbish things from Microtech? He doesn't understand, does he? So he phones Dave. And Dave points out a few of the mistakes that he's made. So what did he do? Well, one of the things he did was he believed the sales and marketing material, because that assumes a perfect world, doesn't it? It assumes you're like on an, on an airfield, on a runway, with the access point on a six-foot pole, and then you go off and drive away from it as far as you can until eventually the Wi-Fi drops out, and that was 600 feet. You've seen the adverts from BT with the helicopter, haven't you? Yeah, 600 feet it was. Yeah, right. So, there's a slight difference between when you talk to a technical engineer and sales and marketing, okay? The other thing, of course, he put it into a Faraday cage. The steel cabinet may have had a glass door in the front, but certainly on all the other sides, it's metal. So that was shielding it from going off into all those directions. And not only that, he put it on top of a microwave nearly a kilowatt of 2.4 gigs on within about two feet of it. The other thing is, is the five gig radio also is also going to be very, very significantly shielded. So even though it's not going to get interference from the microwave oven, it's certainly going to get shielded by the metalwork in the, ca in the cabinet. 
The other thing that he made an assumption about was that the amount of signal strength you receive on your phone indicator is just garbage. You may as well just ignore it. It is not going to give you an accurate description of the real genuine performance of a wireless network. It is not all about signal strength at all. The other thing is since antenna gate, the infamous uh, little problem that they had with the antennas on the iPhones was they slowed the response time down so that when you put your hands to short out the antennas on the iPhone, it still gave you five bars. And so members of the public who are unknowledgeable about this thought, oh, they fixed it. If you held your hands shorting out the antenna for a good 10 minutes or so, then you see it go dun 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 drop out. But most people have got bored by then and wouldn't look at it anymore. So don't use your phone, don't use a tablet for telling you how strong or good the Wi-Fi is. It's meaningless, completely meaningless. The other problem is, is the newest update from Google with uh, Pi is they have now crippled the Wi-Fi scanning speed. They've now not permitted Wi-Fi analyzer apps to scan at the speed at which they previously did on older versions of Android. So if you download an app onto your Android tablet or onto your Android phone, yes, that will now give you a faster update refresh time, unlike the Apple does. But unfortunately, uh, if you've updated it to Pi, it won't anymore. It'll be something like five scans a minute or something. It's really, really slowed it down. They, apparently, the reasoning is to do with battery saving or something. They, is, to, is to try and improve the battery time. But it didn't go down very well with developers. So he goes back to doing some Googling. And he's found a website that talks about the fact that there is more than one channel on 2.4 and on 5, and there's a very strong possibility that you're sharing the same channel as someone else next door to you. That must be it. I'm on the wrong channel. There are 13 channels he's read in Europe on 2.4, and there's about 19 of them, depends on exactly which country you're in, in Europe, on 5 gigs. I'm going to put the access point onto every single channel, and I'm going to test with my phone again. You can feel the swirling hole he's drowning himself in, can't you? The trouble is, when he goes into the Microtik scan list, he thinks, well, that's funny. I haven't got 13 channels on 2.4. I've only got seven. That's weird. Must be a bug. Can't be me. It must be a bug. So he chooses each of the seven channels in turn, walks around the site, does some speed testing now. Doesn't make any difference, it's still rubbish. Wish I'd never bought Microtech now, he's starting to think. Unless he's actually standing right outside the data cabinet, and then it's not so bad. He's actually starting to get some reasonable speeds if he's within a few meters of it. And here's his config. It's the standard, out-of-the-box, default Microtik configuration. Anyone spot the mistake on 2.4? 40 meg CE. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the 5 gig one again. A very, very basic setup indeed. What bandwidth is he using on 5 gigs? 80 in an office environment, C-E-E-E. -E -E. So what's he gone and done wrong? Well, he's basically trusted that Microtik can read your mind. He's trusted into the fact that Microtik's default configuration works in every single situation, in every single setup, everywhere in the world. Except it doesn't, does it? So therefore, don't use the default config. You're going to have to do each one by hand for your particular setup. The one thing that it defaults to is the United States FCC channels. It assumes that when you buy a Microtik, you're going to use it and deploy it in the United States. If you use the default configuration of 40 megahertz, then there are only seven 40 meg channels. 
I'm not saying that they're any good, but you can select from seven different 40 meg channels. And that's the reason why you can only find seven in the drop-down list of what frequencies to choose from. The other thing is, is that it contains all of the channels that are available for you to select from, even if they're stupid, because they're going to end up overlapping with each other. If you're not already aware, there may well be 7, 13, 19, or however many channels there, in me, there may be in the scan list, but they'll all be 5 megahertz apart. The Wi-Fi standard is that the channel bandwidth is increments of 20, not 5. And so therefore the scan list being in 5 megahertz increments are not individually able to be used. You can only use every four because then they're going to be 20 megahertz apart and won't overlap. The other thing is that he has not realized as well is that he has not reduced the transmitter power. It is running to the American standard. They're allowed something like about two watts on 2.4 gigs. You'll never get a client talk back to the AP at those kind of powers. But therefore, it means that the MicroTik out of the box with the factory default settings will run at full power. That actually causes some of the higher MCS data rates to start to get distorted and not to perform as well as if you was to reduce the transmitter power. Maybe even if you drop wireless card settings by about 2 dB, things subtly improve dramatically. And it's not just MicroTik that does that. There's loads of different vendors who have the same, um, I wouldn't call it an issue, but a lack of understanding that you don't run it at full power. The other thing is, is out of the box, it's running B. We don't like B anymore, except they make honey, but we don't like B. 802.11B, if you are really saying that in your office, someone's going to walk into the premises with a device that only and only supports 802.11B, be afraid. Be very afraid. Okay, we don't need to support it. If you're running a warehouse and you've got barcode scanners from the 1980s, and they are B only chipsets, then fine, okay. Then in which case, you need to deploy access points supporting B. But if you're trying to support office workers with iPhones, tablets, laptops, no. No, 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 not running B, not on 2.4. So that's what happens when you make assumptions. You assume that the default configuration is fine for you, it won't be. So on 2.4 gigs, when you change it to 20 megahertz channel spacing, not 40, it will now open up the full uh, set of channels. You won't just get seven, um, but you can't choose them all. You can only have one, six, or 11, because those are the only ones that don't overlap, because they are four sets of five megahertz apart, one, six, and 11. The other thing he needs to do is he needs to go into the advanced mode because it's hidden until you press advanced mode. Once you click on advanced mode, you will then see that you can change the country that you're in. You can set it to a um, regulatory domain setting and input whichever country you're physically in. The United Kingdom, France, Holland, or rather actually Netherlands, because Holland is part of the Netherlands. Holland is not the Netherlands. Um, the other thing is, is the antenna gain. It doesn't get inserted in by default. So if you've bought a HAP AC, I think all you guys have got HAP AC lights. When you set it in to regulatory domain and country being, say, United Kingdom, it doesn't magically know what type of antenna is fitted to router OS. It doesn't know it. It's not going to extract the information from some hardware device on the board you need to manually put it in. And if you look it up on MicroTik's website, it will tell you how much antenna gain the Wi-Fi card has got, usually around 2, 2 dB I antenna gain. Well, then type that in. And that will then ensure that you're compliant and it will stop Ofcom banging on your door. Because they do, and they have. They've got sharp teeth. 
and let's remove A22.11b. So that was his mistakes. He didn't set it to the right country. He didn't get rid of the 40 megs. He didn't put the antenna gain in. He didn't remove A02.11b. So he's done some more Googling. He may have bought them from us, but he didn't bother phoning us. He was too embarrassed. So he's done some more Googling. And he actually found that just one single access point is going to end up being blocked by the walls of the office. And that explains why the signal's so rubbish. Right. The walls are blocking it. In which case, he decides, having read a blog about how to deploy access points successfully, it said you need one access point for every single room in the building, preferably mounted in the middle. Very nice for us. He puts in an order for a dozen uh, access points and deploys them, one in every single room. He then tries to put each one of those onto non-overlapping channels and finds, of course, that when you go round the building with just 1611, 1611, 1611 round the room, you're still going to have some of them see each other. But he doesn't realize that really fully because he's thinking, oh, the walls will shield it, it'll be fine. Funny thing is, though, because he forgot to do the 40 to 20 meg setting change, he's now gone from seven channels to nine. He's learning very slowly, isn't he? The other thing that he's noticed is that he's now finally got a tablet that does five gigs as well as 2.4. And he walks around and he finds that when he sits underneath one AP, he doesn't even see it at all. He logs into the router OS settings and it's definitely operating but there's nobody registered to it. There's nothing in the registration table. And it will not connect to it. The mobile device, when he's in the room with the AP set to that five gigahertz channel, which has been set to either one he's put it on manually or set to automatic, it won't connect to it. Weird, why have I got black holes of coverage? We'll soon find out. He's made an assumption. So what is the problem with running with 40 megs on 2.4? For a start off, there aren't that many clients that will support it out of the box. You have to go out of your way to, to force it quite often. And the other clever trick with running 40 megahertz on 2.4 gigs is that the standard, the 802.11n standard that gave us 40 megahertz channel spacing and channel bonding on 2.4 gigs, the standard says that there is this scanning capability built into the Wi-Fi device that says if you see anybody out there that is using a 20 megahertz channel, back off, drop down to 20 megs so as not to cause them interference. So you may have an access point which is running 40 megahertz, but if it sees a client walk into the building on the same channel, it doesn't need to be connected, it just needs to see its beacons or its probes, just needs to see transmissions coming from that device, and if it sees that the settings on that device is a 20 megahertz only channel that it's transmitting with, the 40 megs drops down to 20 automatically. It's called an intolerant bit, or 40 megahertz intolerant bit. So what's the point? Because if any access point in the building here is anyone using 20 megs, it's going to drop and fall back to 20 anyway. So we've got the black holes problem still. What's he going to do about his black holes? Who's he going to call? Hopefully us eventually, because it's going to save him an enormous amount of time. But he talks to Dave. And Mike gets advice from Dave, and he says, all your problems are solved if you put in the country, put in regulatory domain, put in that you don't want B, so you just select G and N only, put in the antenna gain, put in just the three frequencies that are available on 2.4. You may as well enable WMM quality of service support and turn off that vulnerability with WPS as well whilst you're at it. 
Very, very similar setup on five gigs as well. Antenna gain of two. Just leave the frequency on automatic. There's loads of channels on five gigs. Just let it select any one that it wants. Now this is the reason why we have a black hole. This is the reason why we have lack of coverage on five gigs. Is because of that setting there. Not every client has been certified to operate on all of the five gigahertz radio channels. There are a large number of Google devices or you know Android devices that do not support what is called in the UK band B. They support band A and band C because they're the American Wi-Fi channels, but they don't support the radar DFS channels on band B. And if they don't support them, they won't listen for them, they won't connect to them, they won't see them. And that's why when he walked into a room with his mobile device and that AP had been set to automatic, it had decided that there was a nice, clear, unused, vacant channel on, say, 5600, which is a DFS channel, and he walked in there with a device that can't even see it. Black hole. So if you are going to use Wi-Fi on DFS radio channels, because there's loads of them available, and it's not a bad idea to do that, it's fine for indoors Wi-Fi. However, bear in mind that if you've got people walking into your premises with devices, what they call it, bring your own device, and you have no control over them as to what they're going to bring into your property, like hotels, cafes, whatever, make sure that the five gigahertz channels in the building has sufficient coverage on the first four channels as well to overlap the DFS channels. It sounds wasteful, but if you don't, you're going to have clients drop off your network because they walk into a black hole. Whereas if in that location you have enough crossover from another AP, perhaps in the room next door, that is on, say, 5180, which is one of the first four channels on five gigs, She'll stay connected to the AP next door. It will never even see the AP in this room, say, but at least you've still got connectivity because you've thought ahead that you need to provide coverage for those devices that don't support the DFS channels. Dave gives up at this point and says, you need to speak to a consultant. So he talks to us. Apparently, I know one or two things about Wi-Fi. And um, I basically tell him he's got a hell of a lot of spare access points that he can put on the shelf. Now, we do not have a very high failure rate with Microtech devices. I think we find that they're one of the lowest in the industry. The actual quantity of RMAs that we get due to dead on arrival products, products that actually have been plugged in and failed to function because of an electronics fault, is near zero. We do, however, find a very high failure, re failure rate due to configuration errors. We find that when we reset the device and put just a simple config on them, they work absolutely fine. So it's a config error. So I said to him, basically, you've got a lot of access points you can now put on the shelf and there'll be spares for you for one day in the future whenever you need to replace any. Because you don't need them all. You've got too many. Only use channels 1, 6 and 11. Only use 20 megs. And the other trick I told him is reduce the transmitter power on 2.4 gigs by at least 7 dB. Why is this magical number? Well, 7 is a lucky number. So if you remember that, 7 is a lucky number. It's an aid memoir. Oh, look, I can talk French. And that 7 dB is the approximate difference in loss of a Wi-Fi signal on 2.4 versus 5. So 5 gigs will have 7 dB more loss over X number of meters compared to 2.4. So 2.4 will always be better than 5. The danger of 2.4 being transmitted with the same power as 5 is that that means the client will receive a 2.4 signal from the same AP, with the same antenna type, from the same distance away, 
he will receive 2.4 stronger than 5. I can hear alarm bells ringing. And it's not the fire alarm this time, right? Not yet. So 2.4 gigs is going to come through the majority of the time stronger than 5 gigs. So what's your client device going to do? It's going to go, oh, I'll have that. I'll connect to the 2.4. No. What we actually want to do is we want to push the clients onto 5 because there's less interference and there's going to be a better, higher throughput as a result. So we actually need to discourage the client from connecting to 2.4 by dropping the power on 2.4 to in turn then make the client, if you chose exactly seven, it would see it at roughly the same level. So you need to be a little bit more than that if you want to really, really discourage a client from connecting to 2.4. The other thing is, um, yeah, that's what I was saying, 2.4. Uh, turn 802.11b off. We don't need that anymore. So why has 5 gigs got 40 or 80 megahertz? Well, by default, Microtik puts it on 80 for use in the home. If you're going to use a Microtik router in the home, 5 gigs, Wi-Fi, 80 megahertz, fine. I won't have any complaints about that. However, if you've got 80 megahertz, you are going to have four times the channels operating compared to 20 megahertz, you know, 20, 40, 80, you've now got much more spectrum being consumed. If you do that in the enterprise, office, and business sector, you're going to run out of radio channels very, very fast. You're going to come back to what it's like on 2.4. You've only got three channels. So you started off with 19, and if you deploy your office network with 80 megahertz, you're only going to have about three or four channels available that you can deploy in the building. Also, if you are using 80 megahertz, you're going to pick up more interference. You're going to pick up more noise. You're opening the door wider open. You're going to get more stuff coming in. And that means more collisions. That means more dropping of the data rate to slow down to make the link still connect. Because Wi-Fi is designed to go as slow as possible to make it work. It goes as slow as possible to make it work. It will only go faster if conditions are really great. And in an office enterprise environment, 80 megs will never be great. So don't do it. So you could possibly get away with 40. I'll let you get away with 40 sometimes. But if that is still causing throughput issues, you can even find you'll get more throughput by reducing the bandwidth because of the problems of noise and interference. You think, oh, if I double the bandwidth from 20 to 40 to 80, I'm going to get higher and higher and higher data rates. I'm going to get higher and higher throughput. In actual fact, the opposite can happen. You can actually end up with slower and slower throughput. Make sure you provide coverage from Ofcom Band A or UNNI1 channels so as to overlap those areas where you're using the Uni2 or Uni3 space. The other problem is if you're going to be using the DFS channels, what's going to happen when an access point picks up a radar pulse? It goes off the air, which now means you've lost the AP in that room. We have a black hole. But this time, the black hole is not because of the client not seeing the AP. It's because the AP has gone off the air, because it believes it's picked up a radar transmission and has dropped itself off the, uh, off the spectrum. So that's another reason why you need to make sure you provide coverage from some of the other access points nearby on the first four channels in Uni1 or Ofcom Band A. The other problem is, is Ofcom with a fanfare, and I'm not knocking Ofcom in any way at all. In fact, as an ex-employee, I have a contract which still exists, which says I'm not allowed to. But Ofcom announced with a big fanfare that they'd expanded the amount of frequencies available for Wi-Fi up into the 5.7, 5.8 gigahertz, what was called band C block of spectrum. Fantastic, great. So now you've got even more channels to choose from to build your office enterprise Wi-Fi system. However, I haven't found any clients that reliably support it. 
So I know you have to build it and we wait for them to come. But if you end up deploying APs on these new frequencies, on the 5.7, 5.8 gig part of the band, you're not going to get many people connect to those APs. So feel free to build it and wait for them to come, but you may be waiting a long time. Or if you are going to deploy stuff in band C, make sure you've got some other APs nearby on band A to cover them for when no one connects to them. So I've told him to turn off all of the other APs. He's only got a limited number of APs running on 2.4, so I told him to turn the 2.4 gigs off completely on half of them. I'm using one six, channels 1, 6, and 11, which is 24, 12, 24, 37, and 24, 62. 20 megahertz channels. And forget the one in the canteen completely. Pointless. Just let that one be a router and leave it as a router and don't have any Wi-Fi on it at all. Five gigs, yes, okay, you can have it in every single room if you want. But you can keep the power down now because you don't need to cover more than one room. You can turn the five gig power down so that the devices roam a little bit better and don't end up becoming sticky clients. Heard of this expression, a sticky client? A client stays connected to an access point and it is up to the client to decide when to roam. There is very little that you can do to make a client roam. You can kick them off the access point, but they could very, very easily reconnect back from whence you've just kicked them from. It is down to the client and it's up to the client to decide where it will connect to. So. Um, one of the other vendors, for example, do what they call a soft kick, which is that when you have said you want to enforce uh, a limited number of clients to be connected to a particular AP to do a bit of load balancing on it, they'll kick the client once, but if the client comes back, they let it reconnect. So even though you may have set a, a hard limit at, say, 10, 10 clients maximum, you may find you've got 12 or 13 clients connected to it. Wow, that was loud. So, how to stop a client from being sticky is very, very difficult. But the one thing you can do is, because it's down to the client's software to decide when to go, when to scan, when to move to somewhere else, reduce the signal strength on every AP. Still make sure that every AP has enough RF signal strength in each area to do the coverage in that room or in that location. But when the client moves away from the AP, the signal drops off very quickly. So you use the room, the walls, the building to your advantage. Use the attenuative properties of the building to enforce your rules of when they need to drop off the AP. So when they walk out of the room and go out the door and go around the corner and go into another room somewhere else, you're hoping that the signal that they are currently connected to weakens very quickly, forcing the client to rescan and find a brand new AP to connect to, which is strong enough for it to work with. And one of the ways you can do that is also by lowering, is, sorry, not by lowering, by raising the basic rate. By default, the basic rate is six megabits per second on, uh, say, five gigs. And at six megabits, if you lift it to 12 megabits or even 24, what happens is that the client will get kicked much sooner or will kick itself off your network much sooner. Do this carefully, test it. If you're gonna be running more than two access points, I would recommend it to the guy that what he should do is just run Capsman because by using Capsman, you then have one single system, one single setup, and if you make a change in that one single location on Capsman, it will propagate to all of the access points on the network. And within seconds, you've got the whole lot all configured the same. Significantly reduces the amount of time it takes you to configure the network. It's very, very simple to set up Capsman, even if I did design a one-day training course for it. The other thing to bear in mind is if you are deploying Capsman, is that you can press the button on a cap 
to put it into caps mode so that it will auto join your caps man really easily but you haven't actually done anything about the security of the wireless access point if you don't want people to gain access to the wireless access points you need to put some security on it don't you because otherwise someone could log into it with say Mac Telnet or Mac Winbox and it's hacker day time so don't do it don't forget to go back once you've got it configured put security on it so I'm going to very very quickly go through this we download the slides they'll be available off the um, Microtech YouTube um, video channel it'll be underneath the video it will have a link to my PDF and in which case you can read through this at leisure but very very quickly this is the config that I recommended to him so that's a typical channel configuration so I've reduced the power you notice there's about a 10 dB difference between the 2 and 5 gig radio channels 20 megs I have disabled the extension channel because there's an interesting feature on Capsman that if you select that the channel width is 20 megahertz what you're saying is is that each individual channel to be bonded is 20 megahertz now let's have a look to see how many channels are bonded none so if you just set that to a width of 20 you'll get 40 because you haven't configured in Capsman what kind of bonding you want to perform and in this case I don't want any okay but if you leave it at blank or default it will end up doing 40 megs or even 80 if you're unlucky create a data rate profile which does not have B in it so I've removed all the B data rates so there's an example for 2.4 which only supports the G and N data rates we don't need to provide any support for WPA TKIP or any of the other older encryption types we only need to support WPA2 AES so there's no need to do WPA and WPA2 just do 2 with AES disable this latest PMK ID caching feature this hackable parameter of uh, Wi-Fi that allows you to get your foot in the door well you can disable that which is just recent new vulnerability that's been published turn that off the other thing is is that the group key update it doesn't have a value by default it is the group key there are two encryption keys for every connection so when your laptop your phone whatever is connected with WPA2 encryption there are actually two encryption keys configured you may only put the one password in in this case today Microtik but it actually on initial connection for the first time with the access point negotiates two unique encryption keys with you you get an encryption key for your data for your user data for you going onto the web getting your emails but then there is another encryption key which is used for broadcast and multicast traffic because that is an encryption key that's needed to be for shared by everybody because if it's a broadcast packet that is not sent to each individual client device it's a broadcast packet and so the AP transmits that broadcast packet with a commonly known shared everyone has the same one encryption key we need to change that frequently because that's another vulnerability that someone could monitor those broadcast packets transmitted with that single key that never changes so let's change it a bit more often so I set it to one hour hopefully there won't be many broadcast packets there won't be too many for you to be able to store but even if you stored one hour's worth there should not be enough to be able to decode what the key is uh, we set up say a data path setting put it onto a bridge on the Capsman controller that brings all of the connections back to the Capsman router uh, through its own uh, uh, tunnel but bear in mind that the user's traffic itself is not encrypted in that tunnel it's a layer 2 tunnel going back to Capsman so if your Capsman is in the in the cloud if your Capsman controller is a public IP address then bear in mind that all of your customers Wi-Fi traffic is all going over the internet unencrypted 
put it up a IPSEC tunnel or something. We set up the country for the configuration. Uh, we we ref refer to the data path I've, I've configured before. We choose the data rates that I've defined, which only does the G and N data rates. Really simple. Similar thing for 5 gigs as 2.4, very similar config. But of course, we don't need to disable the B rates on 5 gigs. We have a provisioning rule, which means that if the radio supports G mode, I know that's got to be a radio interface that is 2.4. So therefore, apply the 2.4 gig configuration profile. If it supports AC, then it's got to be a new 5 gig card. So in which case, apply the 5 gig profile. So you can have two provisioning rules, one beneath each other, and you'll then be able to provision automatically your CAPS interfaces in CAPSMAN, so all the 2.4s will have no B modes, and all of the 5 gig cards will all have the full rates. And then all you then have to do is enable CAPSMAN manager server mode, switch that on, and tell it to listen to one of the interfaces of where all your CAPS come back to. You are running on a CAPSMAN based system here today. We had a slight problem first thing in the morning. First of all, there was a problem with the hotel internet connection that we got given an IP address by the hotel router, but we couldn't get any internet activity out through their router. So that took a while to fix that. And then I made the biggest mistake that I must be... In 10 years, I have been training students consistently, do not upgrade to the latest beta. my own fault. So you guys are all now running on the latest beta after I've now fixed a feature of upgrading to the latest beta, um, which went a bit unnoticed because it accidentally switched a few of the bridge ports around, which meant that I'm running two SSIDs and some of the access points had accidentally messed up which SSID was connected to which of the two internal networks. So. But in here, 2.4 should be lower power than 5, and I'm still going to go around and fix some of the frequencies to remove them away from the hotel system. So it will improve when I get back to my desk. But at the moment, it's all on automatic with the frequency selection, so there may well be poor Wi-Fi coverage in some areas. But give me about an hour and I'll have it all sorted. At least I did a site survey last night to check what Wi-Fi was in use already. So I know where the holes are. I know where I can plant the channels that I want to put on. Um, the other thing that you can never beat is having good backhaul. You can design the Wi-Fi as well as you like, but if you don't have a high enough backhaul speed connection into your Wi-Fi network, it will be the pits. So. If you find that the Wi-Fi works today, come up to the Lin ITX stand next door and congratulate me. Make me feel good. If, on the other hand, it does not work very well, make me feel bad and tell me about it. I've got thick skin. We've got a TV set up there with the dude, and that is then showing the actual Capsman network and the wireless network that we've got in here today. So, thank you very much. So you just told to reduce the power of access point in each room just to, get, just to give enough coverage for the devices there. How do how you define enough coverage or good coverage in terms of uh, signal like minus 75 dBm or you do throughput test? Okay, this is a piece of string. Okay. It's elasticated. And now I'm asking you how long is it? It varies. Okay, it depends. 
It depends on what type of service you're actually trying to provide to the end customer. Are you just trying to provide background, internet, general surfing, I don't care, it's just garbage, I don't, I'm not bothered. Then the levels for that will be significantly uh, lower that their signal strength can go to before they can drop off the network. But if you're trying to provide a voice network and you've got cordless VoIP phones, please don't do that, okay? If you ever get a customer tell you they want to put VoIP onto your Wi-Fi network, try and dissuade them to go over to DECT instead. Okay, nine times out of 10, DECT will be far superior for voice over IP phones over a wireless network, which is on dedicated spectrum, using fast roaming protocols, and it works really, really well. It's a really old system now, but it's a fantastic protocol that works really effectively well. So use DECT. But the, the levels will depend upon the client's requirements. Um, NEG70 isn't a bad signal level to go for for the client and to say anything, anything that's below NEG70 that a client is connecting to anything less than that needs to be considered to be beyond the range of the AP. And therefore that client, wherever they're standing, there needs to be some provision for them with another AP in their vicinity. Yeah. If, yeah, you, can, you can go down to sort of NEG80 or NEG85, you know, if you want to do in the home and you don't care about your kid's laptop in the bedroom having a really rubbish Wi-Fi signal. So, so it's a bit, depending whether you're in a hospital, educational, office, home, what signal levels you go for. It doesn't really fully answer your question, but I think you get the idea that it's... Yeah, you probably have some experience with setting those. Like, uh, what do you usually... Like, usually for office, that's... About next 75-ish. In, in that area. Because it depends on the client. The one problem that we have is the client device is the weakest link in our system. You can design the most wonderful Wi-Fi wi -Fi system in the world. And the mistake that you can make is walking around to do a survey afterwards with your laptop. Are they going to use your laptop? No. They're going to use their laptop which their IT department may have purchased, which may not have the right drivers. There may be broken configuration on the mobile devices. There may be really old software. Might be very, very sticky and, and, and refuse to disconnect from an AP even though they've gone long, long way down the corridor and should really be connecting somewhere else. You have no control over the mobile devices. You don't really have much control over the signal levels either. It's only in a very, very tightly controlled environment, like if you're deploying Wi-Fi into a hospital, where you are now going to say, not only will we be supplying the APs, but we're going to be talking to you and using your devices to do the survey with, and we've now proven with your devices that the Wi-Fi works really well with your devices, you can then walk off the site happy. But the minute someone brings a new device in, of a new model, a new type, a new software version, your config is uh, it could easily be broken again, or you know, the Wi-Fi could not be functioning as well again. You'll learn to hate Wi-Fi as much as I do. Uh, any mo anyone with another question? In which case, I'll go back to my table and fix the Wi-Fi. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. <laughs>